thank you very much for the uh, introduction. I assume uh, whatever they said is good. Uh, my wife and I are particularly uh, grateful to be here to share with you something that I have been doing and hope that will be interesting to you too. Uh, the topic I have chosen today uh, was really in response to the uh, invitation uh, by also in relation to my work and uh, interest and experience as well. What I'm going to do is, uh, for the coming 45 minutes, 50 minutes or so, uh, I will be sort of you know, following this outline. And uh, sort of a brief introduction of why uh, I chose this uh, topic. And uh, why uh, also uh, uh, time is sort of relevant in dealing with uh, uh, disaster survival. In doing so, I want to introduce uh, one of the uh, 20th century philosophers. Since I'm basically approaching this problem from a time perspective, and I will also be looking at the implications of his way of looking at times uh, in anticipation with how the concept can be translated into clinical practice. Work uh, 30 some years uh, in a clinical setting, starting out with uh, uh, child care uh, work, uh, and later on with uh, family counseling, marital counseling, and then I work in a psychiatric setting for three years. Uh, and then I spent 22 years in a hospital. Uh, providing counsel. Uh, I work in the largest cancer hospital in Toronto. Uh, I deal with terminal patients day in and day out. I tell you this because it will lead to what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, up to now, you know that I have nothing to do with philosophy. I was getting into philosophy not because I was interested, but I was constantly confronted by the patients that I serve. Terminal patients of the no, terminal, you know terminal because you know they, uh, the doctors have done everything what they can for them. So when they exhausted all the uh, uh, bio biological or medical uh, uh, approach with their patients, they were turning over to us to deal with their last stage of life. So in the process of working with this group of uh, terminal patients, one outstanding question constantly come up. <laughs> It's time. Now you and I are sitting here, we are healthy, well. We are conscious of time, right? But we are conscious of a different kind of time. You know now it's uh, 6 30. And you probably think, oh, you know, an hour later I will be having my supper or going home. This is the day to day kind of awareness of time. But it's very different from the notion of time when one is given a terminal diagnosis. For terminal patients, particularly for those courageous ones who are willing to confront their existence. And they often will ask me, how much time do I have left? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Many of you know the uh, Gray, uh, one of the greatest theologians. Uh, he spent a lot of time writing a confession. Confession book 11. He devoted the entire book on the subject of time. And yet, he asked a very basic question. And perhaps many of you know the famous uh, uh, quotation Even from him. What is time? If you don't ask me, I know what it is. If you ask me to explain to you, I don't have a clue. Now he spent a lot of time writing a book. His conclusion is, don't ask me. But uh, here, I will try to use 30 to 40 minutes to tell you what time is. I know it's in Augusta. So, if I cannot explain to you, don't ask me why. Once upon a time, a five-year-old son of a professor, uh, he asked his father, what is time? And the father says to the five-year-old boy, 
if I can explain to you, then I can explain to my students and other people. So if you understand what I'm trying to say to you, then you're doing pretty good. You know, sit, you're all sitting here, you're all great scholars, you're all learning people. So I assume that you will understand. Uh, so much for the introduction. Uh, uh, slides, please. As I said, this fellow is an uh, English philosopher. Earlier, the last speaker was saying that uh, there are different kinds of philosophy. Uh, he is one of those uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, Anglo analytic uh, philosophers. He uh, uh, was educated in Cambridge. Uh, he taught in Cambridge. He lives in Cambridge. He died in Cambridge. He's, uh, his uh, most famous book uh, uh, that we know today, particularly for people with interest in time, is called The Unreality of Time. Uh, the other book he wrote is called The Nature of Existence. He, proposed, he proposes to look at time from three angles. He introduces uh, three ways of looking at time. Uh, to make it easier, uh, we just label it A, B, C. Now this is simple. A, uh, I sort of, you know, put the word aerodynamic. What the aim of time is, basically time is changing. And we all know time is changing. Everyone on the street realized that. We are now uh, 640, 641, 642. It is constantly changing. Just that simple. If you look at time, time is changing. Now, the most sophisticated way of looking at it involves a lot of physics there. When you look at the word change, now change involves motion. And motion involves speed. That is very complicated. But for us, just looking at it as uh, as uh, as a, uh, a passage of time is changing, that would be sufficient for us for today. Another view that he proposes is called the B view of time. The B, the, the word uh, B, we use the word block. What that means is if you, if you uh, look at a block of houses, if I'm just, you know, standing in front of one, it would be difficult for me to see the whole block. The block view of time is really a scientific view of looking at time. I, I will touch on that uh, later. Uh, the C view of time is the cyclical view of time. It is a cycle. You have seven days in a week. You have a season. Winter, rain, Summer, autumn. When Mateka talk about time, he emphasized the A view and B view, particularly in the Western culture. The, the C view is hardly noticed. That would be more interested for people who would be interested in Hinduism or Buddhism. The A view, as I say, is changing. Now, this is the present time. Before I even finish this sentence, the present time is gone into the past. So what we have is only the present. Some take the view that we are only living in the present. Only the present is real and true. The past is gone. The past is behind. The future is not here as yet. Some people live in the present only. So the present in this view, in the A view, has a privileged position because it is the only time that is real. The only time that we are conscious of. We are not conscious of the future. It's not here. We are not conscious of the past. It's gone. Now, so people live in the here and now, nothing else. The problem with this notion of present is because 
the ABO every moment is changing, including the present moment. So the present moment is moving too. You cannot grasp, you know, the present moment. You cannot say to yourself, here is the present. So this moment, is it more important than the past moment or the future moment? Are the A view, the A theories, or the, the, the people who subscribe to the A theory, they say, yes, but this is not. Particularly this runs into the scientific view of time. I will not go into the detail, but the people who subscribe to the B view of time would deny that the, pre the present is the only real moment. So we don't know, we don't know where, the mo where the present moment is, because we, we just don't know where it is. It, we, we cannot hold it. It's constantly passing. Some people say, no, it's not true. The past is not fixed. The past is still open. It is open upon new discoveries, new data, and uh, new evidence. You can reinterpret, revise, rework the past events, and many in history. They call it revisionist. And this notion that time is open has very significant uh, implication to a lot of historical events. This is particular, very sensitive to a lot of uh, societies, uh, or between societies, how one society interprets one historical event. So, uh, uh, and how another society or another culture interpret uh, uh, in a different way the same event. Is there a solution to this? Uh, Go back to Confession 11. Some of Justin's came up with one way of looking at this problem. He takes the view that the present incorporates part of the past. You cannot entirely separate the present from the past. So he calls the present past. If the present past is okay if the past is near the present. But if the past is 2,000 years ago, it's not so close to now, and it hardly can be considered part of now. Look at the future. In the A view, you have the present, the past, and the future. And the present comes from the future. When it comes to the present, it goes to the past. But the future is not here yet. Um, so you, 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 you think you are sure going to have supper. It's between, if between now and your supper time, something unfortunate occur. Will it not turn your fact of having supper into an illusion or into a disaster? The possibility is there, isn't it? We don't like to think along that line. But it's possible because it's not a fact. The future events are not facts. We can anticipate it. We can hope. We can wish. But whether it is fact, you still are confronted with a big question here. So that is the mystery with the notion of future. Is it open? Going on to have supper is what you wish. You think that you have the power to determine that future moment. You would like to think that what you are planning, what you are thinking, what you are doing has bearing on the future. We all want to do that and we all are doing it. Because essentially human organisms are future forward looking. We want to plan. That's part of our nature. But future is not always open. One view about future is future is close, it's determined, irrespective of how our efforts put into it. We have nothing to do with it. We have no control for our future.
So there is a lot of problem with the notion of future, simply because it's not a fact. So much for the A view. You don't remember anything at all about A view. You need to remember right. A view of time is about change and it's changing all the time. Let's take a look at the B view of time. The B view of time, the plot view of time, uh, essentially is essentially a view shared by a lot of modern astronomy, uh, uh, astrophysics. Theoretical physics, philosopher of science, it is based on four laws of nature. Uh, we don't have time to look at these four laws. So, uh, 1915, Einstein published the first law, the law of general relativity, the law of uh, special theory of relativity. In the simplest form, these two laws deals with, deals with the entire galaxies, the entire universe, stars, planets, It deals with the largest picture. Started with the Big Bang, ending with the Big Crunch. And to appreciate these two laws, one has to deal with speed. But there is another universe. There is the tiniest one. There is into the atomic level. And that is the quantum mechanics, so the tiniest world. From the largest universe to the tiniest universe is, grand, is grounded in the understanding of time. If you could remember your high school physics, time is equal distance divided by speed. Speed has something to do with the way you look at things. Now, you and I are physical organisms, and it has three dimensions. All objects have these three dimensions. And yet, I say earlier, all objects, including human beings, so if we, eat, we, if we add the time to, to the three dimension objects, this element of time is part of the dimension and it constitutes four dimensions. And the four dimensional events are considered to be space-time event. Space-time events a relational event and it's never changed, it's fixed. For example, uh, supposing you have three brothers, I will make it four easy. Okay, you're the eldest one, right? You're always the number one, right? The number two is always number two. Relationship is always, you know, a temporal relationship and a spatial relationship. And that relationship is never changed. And that has very significant implication to how we look at events. Because how we look at events from that four-dimensional point of view is based on the notion that there is nothing changed in this relationship. And this four-dimensional moment nice. earlier than another spatial moment, later than another space-time moment. That relationship is never changed. That has implication to what I'm going to talk about, hope of disaster pace and disaster um, uh, survivors. How they look at the relationship with their loved one who are no longer around on account of the earthquake, on account of uh, war, on account of whatever. No longer around. Okay. That is the B view of time. I will very briefly talk about the C view of time. 
I earlier mentioned this view of time is not a very popular view, not a very common view for the Westerners. When I say the Westerner, basically I'm saying ever since the inception of Christianity. And for the last 2,000 years, uh, the sea view of time is sort of, you know, uh, buried somewhere, put aside. <laughs> Before the inception of Christianity, in ancient Greeks and Roman time, there are philosophers who subscribe to this sea view of time. Today, we associate them with the Eastern view of uh, time. That is, uh, the Hindus, the, the, the Buddhists, or the people in the East would take this view as an authentic view for them. Essentially, this view like is repeating the idea that events are repeating repeat again and again and again. It's very repulsive to a Western mind. Can you imagine that to some, today you're a human being, so yes, your next life you come back as a dog. It interests you. <laughs> and also from the theologi from the theological uh, perspective, it is inconsistent <coughs> that the center of Christianity would likely be nailed on the cross again and again and again. There would be no no. So that this view is no no to the Western mind. But this view does bring a lot of comfort to people who know that their life can be different if they work on it. It would be up to each and every individual to work on their present life to accumulate what they call karma. Put it very simply, in your lifetime you got to do all you can for others. You do good work. So eventually you can get out of this repetition. Okay, so we have three views of time. Okay. What are the implications of these three views? Earlier I say the A view of time is always changing. Changing in what way? Always on one direction. One way street. You drive car, you know, one way street. No return. You all know uh, Martin Heidecker. And he says, cross death. In other words, ever since we are born, our time is going one way, it's not reversible. An hour later, we are an hour shorter in our life. So that is a serious implication that our life always going into one direction. Is it a pleasant thought? Well, you know, when we are young, you know, uh, we are looking for uh, to getting a university degree, getting a job, getting married, uh, that's fine. Hey, when we are getting a few years uh, older, or perhaps, a f you know, a few years less, one-way direction of time, not a very pleasant thought. The preview of time says that the relationship between event one, event two, event three is always fixed, always unchanged, and is always there. Now, uh, for example, uh, you and I here in this auditorium, the time we spend together, as much as you hate my speech, you cannot get rid of me in time. This is what gives you sense. Because the space-time relationship is never changed. And this has wonderful implications for dealing with people who lost their loved ones. Of course, it takes philosophical thinking. The sea view, the implication of the sea view of time. Okay, the sea view of time basically says it's, you know, endless. Endless repeating. Now, if it's heavy events, you don't mind repeating, right? 
events like, uh, you know, having a child, events like uh, getting married, events like uh, getting a university degree. The events that are not that pleasant, you don't want to see the repeat. But if you look at this repeating, um, uh, if you look at the repeating uh, event, if you look at the repeating with a different perspective, as the Buddhists or the Tempt or the Hindus would say, life comes back and goes on, but it's not repeating in the same intensity, it's not repeating in the same old way as the last one. And it's each and every one, every, uh, uh, each and every one of us, how we live our life, that can change our next repeating or no repeating of the same unpleasant events in our life. So in other words, you have the power to change the repeating pattern of events. And that's very comforting. Knowing that they have some bearings on how their next life or their next event and I is not determined. Okay, let us then look at the case. What we have is a case about a 32-year-old gentleman whose honeymoon turned into a heartbroken disaster, in which his 28-year-old wife was instantly taken away from him by the tidal waves of tsunami. And he has ever since been wondering, what does it all mean for me? The sudden loss of his beloved wife and his life now is without the comforting companionship of his loving wife. So for people who suffer disasters, they are not dealing with just the loss of loved ones. They are dealing with themselves as well. Because the loss of his wife also is a reflection of his own mortality. We don't often think of our mortality. You remember um, Tolstoy? He wrote a book called The Death of Ivan. Ivan was a very successful, law, a very successful judge with a beautiful wife in his prime time of his career. Very successful. So all of a sudden, he was told he has terminal disease. He was confronted with the issue of his potential soon non-existence. Ah, he said, no, how can it be? Everyone dies. That's true with all other people. But not me, either. We seldom accept our own mortality. <laughs> Until we are confronted, our friends pass away. This young man, his, his wife, suddenly is taken away from him. He is forced to look at his own mortality. Now, how does A view, B view, C view deal with this gentleman? Now, you have to remember, uh, this is a you know honeymoon you know trip, and even then we assume that they have had a relationship for I don't know a, a year, two years, three years before they you know go for their honeymoon. First, they have been some time that they have been together as lovers. This chunk of time, let let's put it, you know, they know each other for three years. This chunk of time. before they met each other, after she is gone, this chunk of time is what they have been together. From the B viewer point, this chunk of time is never... Now, if you look at it from the C view of time, it's pretty horrible. He certainly doesn't want to see his life 
taken away from him again. So out of the three views of time, particularly for people who have no religious uh, beliefs, the B view can be very comfortable. His relationship with his lost wife, within the time that they have been together, is forever frozen in four-dimensional time. Irrespective, he is around to remember her or not because he's not subject to the memory. He is always there, whether he is alive or he's dead. Now, this is a... Uh, you, you require a switch of your thinking. Because we are so, so accustomed to seeing things in future, present and past. It's very difficult for us to switch our thinking and look at time relationship as a space-time relationship, which is called the four-dimensional space-time relationship, which is not change. I close this with just one Okay, it simply is a note. To die is my fate. I do not fear at all death. But what I fear to die... Now this is in view, in memory. The B view offers a better way out of this dilemma. In that, you don't depend on memory to treasure your relationship with your loved one. If you're thinking to look at the relationship on, the, on a four-dimensional way, your relationship with any of your loved ones is eternally there. Thank you very much.